Thank you. Thank you. Just a little of background about Constitution Day. As we know, uh, the U.S. Constitution was adopted September 17, 1787. And so there have been a lot of Constitution Days throughout the history to inspire individuals to actually read the Constitution and understand its importance for the history of the nation. Lastly, uh, Robert Byrd in 2004 passed a, allowed a law to be passed that suggested that individuals who are at universities and educational institutions learn about the Constitution. And we know September 17th is coming up, but we thought maybe a real big start would be here on September 12th. And we have Jane June. So Jane June is a professor of political science at the University of Southern California. She's the author of three books, and she didn't, she didn't want me to mention all the books, so I'm going to mention one. She is an author of three books on political participation in the U.S. Her research focuses on political behavior, public opinion, racial and ethnic politics, the politics of immigration, gender and politics, and political identity. Uh, my favorite book of hers is Education and Democratic Citizenship in America, which is from the University of Chicago Press, 1996, and it won the Woodrow Wilson Award from the American Political Science Association for the best book published in political science. And you should really pick that book up. Her other two books she didn't want me to mention, but her upcoming book on Asian American political participation is going to be a great book that pushes our understanding about this group. She has been a member of the Social Science Research Council's National Research Commission on Elections and Voting and a member of the National Academy of Science Committee on the U.S. Naturalization Test Redesign. She's also served as the Vice President for the American Political Science Association. Uh, she was born in Macon, Georgia to Korean immigrants and raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She earned her degree from the University of Michigan and her PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. Dr. James. Jones. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, happy to be back on the East Coast and to see all this lovely green outside. It's very dusty and brown in Los Angeles now. Uh, I'd like to thank Tyson uh, in particular for inviting me to be here today. It's a real honor to speak to you on Constitution Day or on about near it. I also would like to thank the departments who sponsored this lecture, co-sponsored it, public policy, political science, sociology, and I think anthro together as the well as the Honors College as well. I'm a, a graduate of an Honors College and valued that experience and that is in fact what led me to become a political scientist. Oops. Um, so today, I, I think the way I'd like to proceed is um, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. And throughout, as we're talking, I'm going to ask you some questions. And if you feel that you have questions for me, go ahead and interrupt. and Not interrupt, but go ahead and ask them. And then at the end, if, if people have questions about the, what I've presented or anything else, let's, let's talk about those. And I think after that, we'll have um, some food. All right, so I, I want to talk to you today about the story of civil rights in America. It is most often portrayed, if you look at a textbook or really any television show or other type of portrayal, as these iconic social movements that involved women in their search for suffrage in the early 20th century, and then also among African Americans in the mid 20th century with respect to voting rights. Now, civil rights, of course, today would not be what it is without these important social movements, but at the same time, they tell only part of the story. Instead, I want to argue to you today that civil rights is an ongoing political dynamic and that the, the circumstances of civil rights in the United States tells us how we as a people understand who belongs and how we should treat one another. So when we think about civil rights, it's not something that we accomplish that's over now. It's an ongoing and a dynamic struggle that tells us that we as a people decide and demonstrate who is allowed to belong in this polity, and then beyond that, how we treat one another. So I want to start out with a couple of questions that will animate my talk today. The first is, what are civil rights? They're not things that are necessarily apparent at present. They haven't always been the same. And then furthermore, whose rights are protected? And then in particular, what does the Constitution have to say about these things, these two questions? Now, what I'm going to suggest to you today um, is that the foundations to answer these questions are apparent in the Constitution, um, but more importantly in the politics that Americans, ordinary Americans make. So constitutional protections are a necessary, though insufficient, condition for civil rights. And they are not sufficient, then, to guarantee equality in the American context. 
Instead, finding equality is really up to all of us as Americans. Um, it is because of the actions, whether individual or collective, by everyday Americans like us, that this nation has been moved to try to live up to the simple and powerful, apparently self-evident claim in the Declaration of Independence that all of us, men and women, are created equally. So let me begin by just giving you a sense of what we're going to do in the next few minutes. I'm going to talk about these three topics. The first is just looking backwards to the origins. This will be familiar material to some of you, but at the same time I think it's worth repeating about the origins, some of the origins of civil rights in the United States. We, they, these are Civil rights, by the way, are a relatively new concept with respect to the entire history of the United States. Then I'd like to talk about the central piece of the argument that I wanted to make to you about belonging, how civil rights and how we understand civil rights are a function of who we as a people decide who deserves to belong and how we treat one another. And then finally, the going forward part is really a question of the future of civil rights. Who is protected? Do, do, do LGD, LGBT people have civil rights? Do immigrants have civil rights? Do women, do white men have civil rights? The answer to all of those questions is yes, and we'll cover that. Um, so let's see. My argument here is that the story of civil rights in America exemplifies this ongoing struggle between the norm of equality, which we all seem to accept. You find very few people on the street who say, yeah, I'm for inequality, right? Most of us are for equality. And yet at the same time, this enduring practice of exclusion that we find in the US context. And that exclusion has long animated the practice of American democracy. And for the narrative for my talk today, I'm going to talk about immigration. You live in a high immigration state in Maryland. I'll bet this place looks totally different today than it, this place, not just UMBC. But if you go to a, do you have Walmart around here, Target or something, into any store that you go into today, you'll probably hear at least 10 or, or five different languages being spoken. You wouldn't have seen that uh, 10, 15 years ago. So I'm going to use the narrative of immigration to talk about civil rights. So before we do that, let me just define it for you, defining civil rights with respect to how we think about it in the US context as protections by government against unlawful discrimination. Now this seems pretty straightforward, right? Um, but remember that for most of the history of the United States, many people did not have any political standing. And the category of free person or citizen and then voter were highly exclusionary categories. Now in particular, let's go, since it's Constitution Day, or will be in a few days, let's talk about what's included in the Constitution with respect to civil rights. It, it actually, uh, if you look at the original document, or the document as it was unamended, the first place to look in the Constitution, you can really find three very good examples of exclusionary practices. What are some of those? Let me just give you three to begin with. And they all persist in, they, they were all placed in the Constitution and persist in there as a function of the protecting the institution of slavery. So when we celebrate the Constitution today, we must also consider the extent to which exclusionary practices are part and parcel of the founding document of this nation. The first is, of course, the Slave Trade Clause. Article 1, Section 4. What's, does anybody remember what the Slave Trade Clause is? Yes? Did, um, they talked about 20 years, and after 20 years, they couldn't import any more slaves. That's exactly right. So the, the trade of, of human beings as slaves was allowed until 1808. Right, exactly. The fugitive slave trade, the fugitive slave clause, of course, Article 4, Section 2, and I'm not going to continue to enumerate the question, I just want to do these three, is that slave states had extraterritoriality, right? So if you're slave in Alabama, let's just pick on Alabama today, but if your state in Al if your slave in Alabama somehow escaped to a free state, you would have to be returned. That's part of the Constitution. And finally, of course, what's the most perhaps ignominious uh, slave clause in the United States Constitution, our founding document? What was it? It's a fraction. The three-fifths clause, right? The three-fifths clause, right? Which is that we counted African slaves as three-fifths of the population, and that was significant with respect to the apportionment of legislative seats. Now, why is that this being a part of the Constitution required us to do what then? required us to enumerate the population, which is, of course, also in the Constitution, but it required us to enumerate the population by counting people in terms of what else? By race, 
right? It required us to count by race. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say you must count people by their race. But the fact that the three-fifths clause is a part of the Constitution and remained so uh, until the Civil War meant that we had to enumerate race. This is going to become a uh, figure and important a little bit later. So you might wonder, well, wait a minute, didn't the Bill of Rights protect civil rights? Well, it didn't um, with respect to the, in particular, an important Supreme Court decision in 1833 called Barron versus Baltimore, which established the concept of dual citizenship in, in, in the sense that states and individuals could be citizens of both the state as well as the federal government. All right, so now we're under the Civil War amendments. Um, this is just an overview of the amendments that uh, over the course of the, the first century of the United States, until the Civil War occurred, we had all of these elements in the Constitution, in particular those three, uh, three clauses. 13th, of course, abolished slavery. The 14th is the most important amendment, element of the Constitution today with respect to civil rights protections. And it is, in fact, I think, um, the target uh, in some political circles for repeal. Um, there are a number of uh, candidates on the Republican side, in particular, who, or libertarian, I suppose, uh, but Republican side primarily, who have an eye to uh, get rid of the 14th Amendment to repeal it. The likelihood of that, I mean, other experts in the audience, please, uh, you may suggest that this would be unlikely. Nevertheless, the 14th Amendment is super important. It's important not only for establishing citizenship by birthright, which is relatively uncommon in the world, um, not unknown, but less common than, for example, uh, citizenship through a bloodline, okay, uh, sanguine, I believe. There's also privileges and immunities, equal protection and due process. These are all elements of the 14th Amendment that provide the basis for civil rights protections in the United States. And of course, the 15th Amendment guarantees procedural, uh, or rather, voting rights. So did these things work? Did they work? Well, they're part of the Constitution, right? Actually, they didn't, right? They didn't for a whole number of reasons, and I won't necessarily, I won't go into detail on all of them, but let me instead give you an example a vivid example of how it is that the 14th Amendment, nevertheless, despite requiring equal protection, due process, and privileges and immunities, and the 15th Amendment guaranteeing voting rights to all Americans, we still have this. Now, what is, obviously this is a bar of soap. Right? Now, I grew up in the American South. I was born in the American South. and. Uh, I don't want to tell you how long ago that was, but I was born at, before the Civil Rights Movement. And when my father was there, um, this, this test was actually used in Georgia. And so the question is, and I would, let's assume that I'm, it's unlikely, but let's assume that I would be the polling, at the polling place. And I would ask you, sir, how many bubbles are in this bar of soap? You, you came here to vote, right? Yeah. You. Okay. How many bubbles are in this bar of soap, sir? Yes, how many bubbles, this is your, you know, to, to get into the polling place, how many bubbles are in this bar of soap? Any bubbles. You don't see any? Okay, well that's right, you can go in and vote. Ma'am, and, and you, you're here to vote too, right? How many bubbles are in this bar of soap? Oh, well, I'm sorry, that's not the right answer. So you won't be able to vote today. Now this is an exact, now, so really, how many bubbles are in this bar of soap? Nobody knows? Is there a right answer to this question? There is no right answer to this question. And yet this question, this is a commonly used, there were other ones, you know, ones that looked a little bit more. Also, this is kind of gross because you can see it's a little bit dirty in the soap dish. But this, I just plucked this one off the internet. But my point is that you would, they would take a bar of soap out of the pocket and here, here would be the soap. And if you were white, I, I look at you and I think you might be white or you might be classified as white. So I, I allow you to vote. And I look at you and I think, well, maybe you're not holy, you're not white. You're according to a, some classification, namely a census classification, you might be less than white, okay? So this was a test used widely in the state of Georgia, among many others, right, of literacy tests that were used as many as 100 years after the passage of the 14th Amendment. So you have to wonder how and why it is the case that 100 years go by after the 14th Amendment, 
And guess what? We uh, have tests like this that persist, that are not, that do not then therefore allow for equal voting rights and privileges and immunities and equal protection by the law. Now there were also poll taxes, right? The requirement of paying money in order to, uh, or having property in other ways to uh, vote. Uh, we also had a number of uh, cases throughout this period, namely the slaughterhouse cases, um, the civil rights cases in the 1880s that overrode efforts to get rid of examples like this. And uh, then, of course, the, the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson decision by the United States Supreme Court in 1896, establishing the doctrine of separate but equal public facilities. And what is it that changed it all? Well, what changed it all is a, a slow process of civil rights movement that was undertaken by ordinary people as well as organized interests. Now, what I want to, I'm using this example and in indicating to you that this happened a hundred years after the 14th Amendment was, was passed. If the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, how is it and why is it that we continue to have for 100 years after that, persistent exclusion from voting and other political rights in the United States. This is something that's difficult to answer. You may wonder if you look through an, a typical American government book, you'll say, well, you know, we, we have the 14th Amendment, and isn't that fantastic? And it works. Well, it didn't actually work for quite a long time. And in addition to that, it didn't work equally across groups of people. So what I want to suggest to you in response to this question of how exclusion could have lasted so long and what is behind it by asking you to remember what I started with, and that is the tension between a norm of equality and the practice of exclusion. Categories of people that were based in things like race or gender, ethnicity, sex, wealth, religion, religion was a big one in the United States in the early founding period, have been formed into a category of desirability. And this has been a defining feature of the development of civil rights in America. In ranking groups then, from the most to least appealing, this is consistent with the extent to which people who are classified in categories at the bottom will not enjoy civil rights at the same level as others. So I'm gonna ask Rowan, Rowan to read this, and I'd like you to Tell me who said it. They will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. Which leads me to add one remark, that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionally very small. Why increase the sons of Africa by planting them in America? Where have we where we have so fair an opportunity by exclu excluding all blacks and tawnies, but perhaps I am partial to the complexion of my country, for such kind of partiality is natural to mankind. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Now, who do you think said this, and when? Anybody? <coughs> Take a wild guess. It was not Lou Dobbs. Okay, yes. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, close, but no cigar. Who else? I already gave it away because it was way back, but who else might have said this? Ben Franklin. ben Franklin. This is the iconic founding father of them all, Ben Franklin. And by the way, who was he talking about here? I mean, this is an unusual word. Um, I think it means brown. But, but who was he talking about? Who was going to mess up? And there's a, it's a much longer quote. It comes from a speech in, in 1750-something. Who was he talking about? Yes? Uh, Native Americans. Native Americans. Nope. Close. Well, actually not, because they th this population was not Native. But a good guess. Yes? Mixed? Mixed? Nope. This is Pennsylvania. He was talking about Germans. This is a quote about Germans. So the argument by Franklin was, what were the Germans? I mean, I, I sort of think of, white, of German people as like the whitest people on the planet. And we think that now, but at this time in the 1750s, when the United States was still not the United States, it was a colony, 
in the colony of Pennsylvania where uh, Franklin was, what were the Germans? They were outsiders. What, what, did lang or what religion did they practice? They were primarily Catholic and there was tremendous anti-Catholic sentiment in the United States at that time. So what I'm trying to illustrate with this is that the notion of a hierarchy of people, of a place of America as being for one type of person has been present in the United States from before the founding and continues to persist. So let me take you to this then next. Now remember after the Civil War amendments and uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th, we had a brief period in the United States, uh, in the South in particular during Reconstruction, with the exception of the black coats, of course, where there, was, uh, there were voting rights for African Americans to a substantial degree. And this all gets shut down around 1877, right after the 1876 election, which was a contested election. At that point, a deal was struck, and the federal government removed troops from the South, which then led to a century of Jim Crow, that is to say, state-sponsored racial segregation. But it wasn't only there, right? So this is actually a cartoon from the same time period after the end of sort of Reconstruction and after the election of 1876. And I don't know if you can read this caption from far away, but it says, racially charged portraits of the two leading threats to the Republic, the Negro and the Celt, Harper's Weekly, 1876. How many of you have um, Irish roots? Irish people, okay, so uh, this, what, what, are, what is the Irish portrayed as? I mean, what is, what, what is part of what's going on in this cartoon? So he's on a scale, right? So here's the black, right? It's his physiognomy looks like. Okay, and who is this one? This is the Irish guy. He's white. looks like a monkey okay so this is the illustration of uh, an illustration which says that the, even though the Irish is supposed to be white he's just as bad as the Negro okay, okay no question All right so one of the arguments or none of the arguments this is you think this looks pretty crazy today right I guess not that crazy compared to some of the stuff we do see but nevertheless what this demonstrates is how significant the bias against um, new groups that were arriving in the United States at that time was. So for example, during this period, um, if you have Irish roots, your predecessors probably, the majority of, of the Irish people came over um, from the mid 19th century until about the early 20th century when immigration was shut down. Two other groups came in large numbers from Europe, who were they? in addition to the Irish. Italians. Italians. How many Italians in the, out there? How about Jews? OK, Italians, Irish, and Jews were the three groups that were considered to be uh, less than white. Right? They were, there was actually something quite bad about these groups. And they were either criminals, drunks, uh, avaricious, um, stealing, uh, all kinds of negative stereotypes attached to these groups, nevertheless still classified as white. So pressure from then, as time went by, this is 1876, right, as time went by, immigrants began to flood American cities. We had no immigration policy at that point. Unlike today, we did not have immigration policy except for uh, Chinese exclusion, Asian exclusion policy, which by the 1920s, um, we have a famous act called the Asiatic Bard Zone. Nobody in Asia could come in, but this had persisted from the 1880s on. But on the East Coast, what we saw was immigration from undesirable immigrants from Ireland, Italy, and Eastern Europe, primarily Jews. So what happens then is there's also an intellectual movement flourishing called eugenics. Anybody know what eugenics is? Yes, in the back. Uh, eugenics was a policy that was born out of a, a very bad interpretation of Darwin's theory of Okay, so it's a, that's very good. So it's a question not only of purity, but also of 
a hierarchy of the races and who was on the very top. Uh, whites, pure whites, were on the very top, right? And at this point, Germans had become a mainstay. They had become white by that time, so they had surpassed uh, Benjamin Franklin's negativity about their odd ways and their tawny complexions and their bizarre religion to then become part of the American mainstream. But in the 1870s, up until the early 1920s, the Irish and the Italians were the ones, in addition to the Jews, who were conceived of as being bad for society. And in particular, then, the American government, the United States government, then uh, establishes something called the Dillingham Commission. Dillingham, I believe, was a senator from Vermont. It is, establishes a commission to study the effects of immigration. And let me just read you two uh, clips from a U.S. government document published in 1910 called the Dictionary of the Races. Um, Hebrew. The Jewish nose, and to a, a less degree, other facial characteristics are found well nigh everywhere throughout the race, although the form of the head seems to have become quite the reverse of the Semitic type. For Italians, he describes the South Italian as excitable, impulsive, highly imaginative, impracticable as an individualist having little adaptability to organized society. Now these uh, you can, by the way, this whole thing is available online. It's fascinating. You just look up your own group. If you're like a Swede, you're probably okay. Or from Norway, you, you know, you're, you get good marks for being white. Uh, but most other, most other groups, Albanians, there's some uh, really interesting ones on gypsies and um, still others on uh, Chinese, Africans, uh, American Indians, much much more uh, vivid and colorful than, than these. They're all available online. You can get them either from the Harvard Library or from Stanford's library. And what they detail here is the significance of the government's attempt to try to make sense of all of this diversity through immigration. And an attempt, this, this is a government document based on a report with sociologists and political scientists staffing this uh, particular committee, a joint committee of Congress, to establish a justification for excluding Irish, Italians, and Jews. And in particular, what this does is then create something, the basis for the 1924 National Origins Act, which in essence shuts down immigration to the United States. For a 40-year period, there's almost no immigration to the United States because these groups in particular, Jews, Italians, and Irish, are excluded. And they're excluded based on, on these characteristics of negativity. In other words, that the government had determined on the basis of scientific evidence formed out of eugenics theory, which was at the time flourishing and provided the basis for other fascist regimes, particularly in Europe, to demonstrate scientifically that these groups were inferior and therefore not eligible and certainly not desirable as American citizens. So once immigration gets shut down in 1924 with the National Origins Act, by the way, immigration from Asia has been barred for some time now, and we do not, interestingly, have a policy on North American migration. So people coming from Latin America or from Canada can come over as much as they want. We had no, no policy on immigration until 1965 for North America. What happens then during this time? The Jews, the Italians, and the Irish, they eventually and slowly turn into whites. I mean, if I, I, you're Italian? Yeah. Irish, yeah, Irish. So I look at him today and I think, oh, he's a white guy. But 100 years ago, you would have been classified as something less than white. And the same is true for Italians and Jews who eventually faded into whiteness. Black stayed black, okay? 90% of the U.S. population in 1960 was white, and 10% of the population was black. And about a half a percent in there was something else. Right? There were less than a million Asians in the United States in 1960. This is even before the annexation of Hawaii and, or rather, the joining of the Union, I should say, of Hawaii and Alaska. There are now more than 15 million Asians in America. America is the United States today. So what happens then during this period of time, between 1924 and 1964, the, the nation becomes very black and white, not because um, we change our categorical system, but because other less desirable groups who were less than white have now become white. And then we move on to this, the, the next step 
which is landmark civil rights legislation. So during this time, we've had two world wars. We have had the prosperity of the 1950s. And we end up then creating, through the movement of ordinary Americans and, and interest groups alike, landmark civil rights legislation. And there are three in particular that are quite important. All the basis of civil rights legislation today, Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and of course the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, the three most important pieces of legislation with respect to civil rights today. Now you've heard a lot about the Civil Rights Act, in particular Title VII, which is about employment discrimination, Title, uh, Title IX, which is about equal opportunity within educational institutions. That's why Candace Parker's a basketball star. It's why the WNBA exists as a function of providing equal opportunity in college sports, for example. But the one that we don't hear too much about is the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. How many of you in the room are immigrants or the children of immigrants? Okay, that's about right for um, a college campus. One in eight Americans today is an immigrant. More than 20% of the U.S. population is an immigrant or the child of, of immigrants, a higher proportion than at any other time in American history. And what this has done then, by the way, when the 1965 Act came in, it struck down the National Origins Act and removed the idea of racial quotas, national origin quotas, but instead changed it to employment preferences and family reunification. So if you're a doctor or a, an engineer or a nurse, you have priority to get into the United States. Immigration, and then at that time, Asian immigration is now allowed again. It was not until 1952 that Asians could become naturalized citizens in the United States. I know that seems crazy, but that is in fact true. Only a, a year or two before my father came to this country could Asians become naturalized citizens. So what the 1965 Act does is alter in very significant ways the face of the nation. So if you just look at this little graphic, you'll see that in 1960, just 50 years before where we are today, the population was 90% white and 10% black. What we have now is about 65% white, Latino, what's called here Hispanic, the largest minority group. Uh, it's interesting to, that it's called a minority group because by uh, the United States government's um, vernacular, Latino Hispanic is not a race, it is instead a, an ethnicity. And then African Americans are now 12% of the population and 4.5% for Asians and I guess President Obama's in the 1.5 there, the multiracial group, two or more races. Though I understand he did call himself African American, full African American on the, on the 10 census. If you look at the bar on the far right, you'll see what the projections are by the government in terms of the Census Bureau as to what we're going to look like in 2050. Whites will no longer be a majority. It's actually a lot, looks a lot like what California looks like, with the exception of the reversal of black Asians. So there are more Asians, in, there are twice as many Asians in California today than there are in African Americans. But this is about what we're going to look like according to census projections on the basis of continuing immigration as well as uh, birth rates in the U.S. So what we see here is a heavily altered American population with the question then being how it is that we understand civil rights. How do we protect and understand what civil rights are in the, in the midst of a population this diverse <coughs> when most of our civil rights legislation and all the concepts in the casework, the case studies and the cases that come before the Supreme Court have been based on African Americans as the minority group in question. So let me give you a, a a sense of the complexity of some of this. Uh, the first is the census classification of ethnicity. If you, if, I mean, you, uh, please tell me you all filled out your census form, right? You, everybody has to have filled out their census form or at least tried to. This is the ethnicity question. Um, this, this is question five, by the way, it comes before six. Six is the race question. But this is five. I only ask you, I'm gonna give you four names and I'd like you to tell me where they go. Manny Ramirez, baseball player for the LA Dodgers. Now, what is he? He is Dominican. So where does he go? I mean, does he check? He checks this one, right? Okay. So he's pretty easy. Giselle Bundigen. You know who she is? Married to Tom Brady, but she's a supermodel. She is from Brazil. Is she from Brazil? 
of German origin, Giselle Bundigen. Like, you can't get more German than that. Where is she here? Is she, by the way, is she Latina, Hispanic? Maybe. Who? Who's that? I don't know him, but yeah, what about him, you know? Okay, so here's the same question. Does he fit in here? What about George Lopez, you know, the comedian? We're like, oh, he's easy. He's easy, right? He should be yes, because he's Mexican, Chicano. But Giselle Bundigen is not easy. And what about Bill Richardson, Democratic candidate for president, former governor of New Mexico? What does he answer in this question? Is he yes? He looks skeptical, no? He would answer yes, here. Now, on this one, this is the race question. And I think one of the most interesting, so you, you could go here. So Giselle Bundchen, we, we're not sure about her, but I, I would probably put her under yes. I think she considers herself. How about Cameron Diaz? Let's use Cameron Diaz, because she, she considers herself to be Latina. Or Shakira. Shakira's another good example. These are all blonde ladies who are, who are considered themselves Latina. Okay, so we say yes here, but then where do they go here? And one of the most interesting things about this is that we have, uh, is there another Asian person in this room? Raise your hand. What are you? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's unusual. Okay, so you would put yourself under other Asian, right? But I'm a different race than you because I'm Korean. But white, you get stuck together with you, with you, with you, whoever else is white, and you all get stuck together. You can't call yourself any other race but white. But you and I can differentiate ourselves according to the government. Yes? I always check some other race and write in the word human when I do my medicine. And that drives people at the senses crazy, right? Because how are we going to fit men? And why do we keep doing this, by the way? I just I have one more example for you. Okay, so what is she? Does anybody know her? Does, that, nobody, does anybody watch E? She is Chilean, but she looks Italian, American, Guidette to me if I've ever seen one, right? So if you watch, I, I, I actually did watch the Bravo, or it's not Bravo, it was the E, True Hollywood Story on Snooki. Snooki, if you don't know her, is a star of the MTV show called Jersey Shore, and she considers herself to be a Guidette, which would be her, a term of endearment, according to her, as an Italian American, and yet she was born in Chile uh, to Chilean parents, but adopted by Italian Americans in New York. So where would, where does she go here? Can you be what you think you are? You can be what you think you are. Yes, yes, you can. Nevertheless, it raises the question of well, I, uh, maybe let's leave her on for a moment. Uh, while we talk about this, it raises the question of how complex and what the what the differences in enumeration categories mean. Because why do we still do this, by the way? Why are we still doing this? We don't apportion anymore by the three-fifths rule. That's gone. So why do we still have, to have race on the census? Or even this guy? Because by the way, Mexicans were considered white up until 1980 in the American census, with the exception of the year 1930, when the census created a category for Mexican. And by the way, if you are Indian or Pakistani, you would have been considered Hindu for one year. And likewise, Hebrew also had a category at one period in time, for one year, for one census. So why, but, but leaving that weirdness aside, why are we doing this still? Yes? Because we've created a Okay, so that's part of it, right? So we have categories for which that are considered protected categories. So the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and its, and its amendments create protected categories. In addition to that, so what we're doing is we're enforcing civil rights law, right? We are also enforcing voting rights law, which requires us to enumerate here. So this is why calling yourself a human annoys the you know, Census Bureau because they can't figure out where you're supposed to be. You may be enforcing identity politics, and that you could you could suggest is another one of the implications of the continuation of the classification system. Yes. 
Yeah, about 10. So according to this, and as you can see the size of, and if you just go back here and look at the far right column, you'll see that the size of the multiracial population is increasing. We have not figured out how to deal with that yet with respect to, to the, to the uh, enforcement of civil rights law. Right, so uh, Afro-Caribbeans and could be either, right? You could be, consider yourself to be racially black, right? Or you could consider your, and still at the same time, consider yourself to have uh, South American origins. It, it hasn't come to a test case yet for us to know. Yes? Right, okay, so, but, and that all goes back, though, a bit to this, doesn't it? To the question of a physiognomy, to a question of the easy identifiability of someone that could be considered an insular minority. Okay, so, but let me ask you about her, then. Let's say that she's trying to get into Harvard Law School. Let's just say she's trying to get into Harvard Law School. <laughs> and somehow she doesn't make it. And let's assume she's got, like, a 175, okay? That would be pretty good score, right? But she doesn't make it into Harvard Law School, and she decides she wants to uh, bring a civil rights uh, case against uh, Harvard for uh, racial discrimination or discrimination under uh, Title or un discrimination under the Civil Rights Act. Would she be um, class? Would she have standing in a court because she identifies herself as white? Or she, she might identify herself as Latina. Would she have standing? <coughs> she would. Um, and I, the, what I want to end with, because I know we're, we're just out of, of time here. I'm sorry. This stuff's so interesting. I'm sorry I'm talking too long. But I, I want to just end by saying that, ask you to think about when we think about civil rights in the United States and the pursuit of equality, substantive equality, uh, procedural equality, it's very difficult to think about civil rights using the old paradigms, the paradigms that we consider to be iconic. That is to say, African American, the movement among African Americans, or, you know, the, in the most monumental struggle for, for civil rights, which took over a hundred years to accomplish, or for that matter, the movement among women. Because today, when we think about the future of civil rights, we are talking about very significant policy decisions access to education, affirmative action, equal pay and sexual harassment, immigrants' rights, LGBT rights. None of these are areas necessarily, in particular the last two, that lend themselves easily to a paradigm built around a black and white divide. But instead, given the fact that immigration has continued to flourish in the United States and increase the, the racial diversity of, of the country, the question is an open one. The extent to which civil rights and the pursuit of equality is closer to what we think it ought to be very much depends on how it is that we understand and negotiate the complexity of race and ethnicity. Thank you. Okay, wanna, uh, now we'll take some questions. Um, so the civil rights movement in Brazil, it's, it, the racial categorization in Brazil is much different. It's much different in the sense that there are more shades, right? So in the United States, if you were, we had the, the sort of otherwise known as the one drop rule. One drop of, of African blood would have made you black. And that even though the census in the United States had multiple categories, for example, Plessy, Homer Plessy and Plessy versus Ferguson with one-eighth black, um, would nevertheless consider it to be uh, African-American uh, or black at that point. Um, it's a very different kind of a situation, right, in Brazil, where I believe the enumerators declare race for you rather than people declaring it for themselves. Is that right? Mm 
So what you see in Brazil is a much different kind of a setup with respect to racial hierarchy. And I think that um, knowing only a limited amount, and comparativists out there, please help me, um, knowing the limited amount about the nature of you know, social movements and policies in Brazil, I would not be, unfortunately, I would not be that optimistic about the, the capacity for the state to expand uh, civil liberties and civil rights for people at the bottom of that hierarchy. Yes? The chart for 2050, what assumptions does that make on future marriage between groups in California? I think the experiences are that we have very high rates, uh, higher than in other places. So would that change fairly dramatically if the intermarriage rates uh, go up? Well, marriage is not going up generally. Right, so but you just mean the children born of two, of people of two different races, yeah. I mean, and that raises the question. Uh, this number probably on the bottom of 3.0 for multiracials probably should be higher than that, right? But the question is, how are people identifying themselves? I mean, you could have, like, my kids. I'm not sure what they're going to do. I think they'll probably do more than one, right? So they they would do more than one. And, but what the question is how it is that the government will interpret the data. I mean, in this case, it's if you, are, if you don't declare one or more and you have, for instance, a social movement group saying we need to count as many Latinos as we can, we need to count as many Asians or as many African Americans as we can, go with a minority group and call yourself that. So really over time what we're going to look like is we have a system here that's classifying by race, but we're going to have very similar intermarriage patterns like we did in the early 20th century when a mixed marriage in the early 20th century was Italian and Irish. That was like a mixed marriage, right? And it turned out to be the case that eventually they just became white. In this case, given, and someone mentioned it earlier, the nature of the categories, it's possible that what we're continually reifying those people like Cameron Diaz, for example. That was a, so as I understand it, these are based on the classifications made by census and projections for minority group status where they where they prioritize minority group status and on the basis of the patterns in which people identify themselves. So if I married um, Bob Smith who was a you know German Catholic, my kids would be counted as Asian in this categorization. Yes? When there was a priority for the family unification and particular types of employment, was that by act of Congress? Was that by um, the Census Bureau? And thus, will that be changed by act of Congress or the Census Bureau? That's a good question. So the question is, how do we get this last policy? Immigration Nationality Act of 1965 is, I think, the most significant act to change the demography of the United States. It, it is, in essence, the same law that governs us today. So until 1965, we had the National Origins Act, which said we don't want Cat we don't want basically they didn't want Catholics and Jews. So no more Italians, no more Irish, and no more Jews. So from particular places, it was cut down. It was reduced to a very very small proportion, only tens of thousands of immigrants, as opposed to the 1.2 to 1.5 million immigrants every year that we see in the United States today. So the I Immigration Nationality Act occurs right during this time of civil rights legislation, where it says. We're not going to do this on the basis of race. We're going to do it instead on employment-based preferences and family reunification. And interestingly, the two people behind this bill are, actually there's three, um, Emmanuel Seller, does anybody remember him? Pounding his fist on the you know, podium in the, on the House of Representatives. I think he's from Brooklyn or Queens or something. And the population that he was representing were who? Who was he representing in Brooklyn? He was representing Jews who could not get into the United States, primarily, by the way, because of FDR. But that's another story. So the question is the, the purpose for family reunification. So it was Manuel Seller, it was uh, Hart from Michigan, and Joseph McCormick from Boston, who, what do you think Joseph McCormick was? Irish, Irish Catholic, right? So the, the vantage point for the uh, federal lawmakers in 1965 was still looking toward Europe to say we wanted to reunite those families, those Irish grandmothers and the Italian you know, grandchildren who could never make it to the United States because we had restricted immigration. What ended up happening is by that time, Europe had already recovered. We had the Marshall Plan. Europe was in recovery, economic recovery, and people didn't want to come to the United States 40 years apart. What instead happened were people from China and Korea, um, South America, Central America, and Africa came and began to bring their relatives. That's probably, that, I mean, 
that's why I'm here, right? That's why probably many of you are here or your uh, family members are here. So that created a chain migration. That is an act of Congress. And if the United States wants to change its immigration policy, it will change it at the federal level. Arizona and Alabama cannot change immigration policy. But the social interaction underneath of it was really what I was trying to get at. So what was the social interaction for the em employment priority at that moment? At this time, what's happening? Um, wh what are we racing to get to in the 1960s? The moon, right? We're racing to go into space. We have this boom of technology. What's that famous line in the graduate? Plastics, plastics, plastics. It's the future of plastics. So engineering, math, and science are all prioritized at this point. We're post-war. We're in a period of boom. And so we're, we have a preference system for high, high skill professions that require high education. So when you see the stereotype of a lot of Asians being smart and good at math, the model minority stereotype, it's not because Asian people have some math gene. It's because most of the people who came here who were Asians, they already came and their parents had a PhD already. So there's a very diff it's a selection bias in the kinds of immigrants that come to the United States from Asia. Yes? You started off talking about the norm of equality, and you've been talking particularly about constitutional as amended and statutes, mm -hmm. landmark statutes. So I'd like to ask you what you think about norms as social norms and widely shared beliefs that affect behavior. Some of the leading behavioral research and political science these days seems to indicate to me that there's still a lot of racism in the evaluation of public policies and particularly President Obama years and so on. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question for you is, do you, do you really think there's even now a norm of equality among the American public? Is there a norm of equality in the American public? Well, that is the prize-winning book, if we could answer that, right? And the question is, I mean, do people have a, a sense of equality and fairness? I think the answer would be yes, and in varying measures, depending on the policies and how much it affects them, right? And by the way, I, I am writing a different book now on public opinion on immigration. And I don't think that we can, and one of the arguments that I'm trying to make in that book is that we can't look at all groups as if they have the same kinds of constraints. So equality for a very advantaged person, sure, equality is fine, right? Except when and until they start to bump up against my floor, right? Equality as a norm for people at the very bottom of the hierarchy is, is something that they can be much more em embracing of because they have nowhere else to go but up or else they're going to stay down. So I think there are variations, and that's why you will see minority populations expressing higher levels of support for policies that are based in a norm of equality versus for people who are higher up in the, in the hierarchy. You have a lot more to lose when if, if you see the American system as a vertical system. And if you're on the top of it, at getting more equality or more access can sometimes topple people off. And this is why you see, for example, the anger and the upset one could argue in Tea Party movements, where they're seeing encroachment upon things that were always entitlements for them. Right? It, it's in part part and parcel of, and it, it's it doesn't mean that these that the Tea Party people are necessarily racist. It means that they they consider they're seeing what's happening to the social system as the demography is changing. And really, if you were in the opposite position and you had you know, uh, Indians on the top and, and whites on the bottom, and we had a surge in the white population, you would probably that, see that same thing happening on the top. So to the question of do we have a norm of equality, I think so. I think we do have one. It, it exists to varying degrees as a function of where you are in this field of racial positionality. Yes? Can you turn the chart back over to that mm -hmm. surface there? Or the, the question? This one? Yeah, isn't that There's weird? No one for ethnicity. ethnicity is, see now, oh, oops, here, if you're Cuban, you're an ethnicity. Okay, so like who's Cuban? Gloria Stefan. Right. She's an ethnicity, but me, I'm a race. What's up with that? I got no answer for you. I'm just saying it's weird. But you, um, you, you consider that you do have an ethnicity. Well, yes, I mean, and this is an interesting aspect of, of the politics of how categories themselves create identities. Because according to the government, I don't have an ethnicity, I have a Korean race. Mm 
but Manny Ramirez, okay, let's not use him. Gloria Estefan has only an ethnicity, not a Cuban race. Right. Right. I'm American, mm -hmm. but I never have a choice to really choose that or That's select right. it. And I'm, since you're in the circle of these people, is there any move to just do away with all that and just be well, one there, human race who can truly be defined that word well, we, we really are? Right. I mean, there's a comment right behind you indicating that it's quite possible that the persistence of these categories are creating greater divisions than they are solving them. And whether that's the case, we will only know that if we eliminate them. Having said that, we do have a history of exclusion on the basis of race and ethnicity. And, and as a correction to that, we have implemented federal laws and constitutional amendments that are attempt to undo some of that harm. In the process of undoing it, are we creating other harms? I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that we all in this room whatever races we are, we share a lot more together than we do if we were all to separate ourselves and by whatever we were supposed to be. You know, we know that race is itself not a biological construct, it is a social construct on the basis of, you know, the science of evidence of genetics as opposed to eugenics. And so that is an important question. Are, will we ever get rid of it? I don't think so, not in, not in my lifetime. Well, just one more thing and then I'll, I'll get off this topic, but just for instance, life when you go through the world and people see me as white and so then if they're going to have this you have an advantage or you have privilege or whatever my personal particular life is I have suffered disadvantage being a woman and not getting jobs because I'm a woman and so it's like well I want to identify as something else but I'm mm -hmm. not allowed to and yeah, I'm going to as a whiner because I've moved on now in the school I'm going to do my own thing but you know it's it, it it's creating also for people to look at something that's really not true either yeah, I mean, I think that one of the best ways to think about this is that you're in the default category. So you're, you're just like, your whiteness, you're white. Do you consider yourself white? You're American, human. And then everything else is measured across, uh, apart from that. I, I can't tell you, for people who look like minorities in this room, how many of you have been asked, where are you from? So they'll say, where are you from? And I'll say, well, I'm from Georgia. And they'll say, no, where are you from? You know? And that implies that there's something conditional about the Americanness of people who don't reflect the default category. Do you think they really have an honest desire to, maybe they've been to a country where people look like you and they want to share something mm -hmm. similar? Yes, they though. absolutely maybe might. they want to say hello in Korean to you. Absolutely, they might. Absolutely, they might. And, you know, I, I welcome that. But at the same time, you could also argue that that difference is a consistent burden that has to be, you're, where you're constantly justifying yourself right. as American. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was some other, yes, in the back. So how is the recession affecting the norm of equality? It's probably beating up on it a little bit. I mean, we can always find examples where when groups are in competition with one another for economic resources that, um, you know, differences between them, whether they're Serbian or Croatian or uh, Tutsi and Hutu or African American and Latino, where tensions, uh, economic stress produces um, a group basis for discrimination. So we oh, we'll we take have to stop. One, okay. one last question. Green spider, do you have a question? Uh, they kind of asked it. Okay. Uh, who hasn't? Who hasn't said? You have. So how, the question is, how influential are, are, are the classification systems of other nations? Probably not that much. I mean, the United States has always sort of done its own thing, which is not to say that it hasn't copied other systems, but 
the way our system, if, if you want an interesting read, I mean, go look at a book by, it's called The American Census by Margot Anderson, and it details this whole bizarre set of classifications and categories that we've used over time. And most of the time, if you look at the documentation be, behind why the, and this I believe would be the Department of the Interior who oversees the, not the Interior, um, what's the department, it's the Commerce who oversees the census, um, really utilizes its own stuff and, and based on, she's an historian, it, based on other documents that have been used, looking at how other nations um, classify race is not something that we have done in the United States to any large degree. There's also a great book called In the Shadow of Race, which compares Jewishness and Latino-ness as ethnicities. It's called In the Shadow of Race by Victoria Haddon. It was published in 2007. It's also, you know, you think this is complicated. I mean, it, it, it's very confusing. It's very confusing, and yet, it's very confusing because something about it's not real. We can feel that it's not real. And yet the implications for policies such as access to education and immigrants' rights and equal pay, gender-based discrimination are all significant um, and based on these categories. So thank you very much. You've been a great audience. <laughs>